Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Ring by Koji Suzuki. Uh, sorry I've not been streaming much the past couple days. Had a lot of things going on, a lot of changes coming. Uh, nothing finished yet, because I still have to go get a couple things. But um, uh, you may have noticed some things are different. The background is different. The camera's in a different spot. Uh, and also, <laughs> uh, I've rebooted my computer, and... Um, reset it so that it would run better, done some things to it, and I backed up everything and saved it, except it didn't even occur to me to back up the font that I used to use for the timer. I can't remember what it was called, and so now it's gone, and that's why it's just a basic image. <laughs> that bugs me so much. I'm gonna have to find a new font, but anyway, that's why the font on the timer looked different. That's all I was gonna explain. Uh, hey, Delvin, Daniel, Raven, Surfin, Daisy, uh, thanks for, uh, joining us. Uh, oh man, moving, <sighs> moving is such a bother. Uh, I'm so tired of moving. Good luck to you, Daniel. Uh, well, we're back with The Ring, which is the book version of, uh, the infamous film, Ring. You know, ps ps the lady cr coming out of her well and doing just fine, but nobody else is. <laughs> um, Samara? I can't remember her name. We may talk about that name today. We are on part three uh, of the story. Last time, um, our, our her hero, uh, detective guy, or newspaper guy, uh, was researching his niece's death, you know, curious, wanting to find out what happened. He ended up watching the tape, and now he's panicking. And so he's brought the tape to a friend to say, hey, bro, what do you think about this tape? You know, let's figure this mystery out. And that's where we are. So, hey, Lobsel. Dirty Mike, hello. Or should I call you Dirty? Dirty Mike. <laughs> Alright, part three, chapter one. October 12th, Friday. First, let's have a look at this video. Ryuji Takayama grinned as he spoke. They sat on the second floor of a coffee shop near Rapongi Crossing. Friday, October 12th, 7.20 p.m., Almost 24 hours had passed since Asakawa had watched the video. He'd chosen to have this meeting on a Friday night in Rapongi, the city's premier entertainment district, in the hopes that surrounded by the gay voices of girls, his dread would dissipate. It didn't seem to be working. The more he talked about it, the more vividly the events of the previous night replayed themselves in his mind. The terror only increased. He even thought he sensed fleetingly a shadow lurking somewhere within his body that possessed him. Ryuji's dress shirt was buttoned all the way up to the top, and his tie seemed rather tight, but he made no move to loosen it. As a result, the skin of his neck above his collar was slightly swollen. Just looking at it was uncomfortable. Then there were his angular features. Even his smile would have struck your average person as being somehow nasty. Ryuji took an ice cube from his glass and popped it into his mouth. Weren't you listening to what I just said? hissed Asakawa. I told you it's dangerous. Then what did you bring me then what did you bring this to me for? You want my help, don't you? If you're taking drinks every time I stumble on a sentence, well you already gotta take one. It's only been two minutes. <laughs> still smiling, he crunched the ice cube loudly between his teeth. There are still ways for you to help without watching it. Ryuji hung his head sulkily, but a faint grin still played over his features. Asakawa was suddenly seized with anger and raised his voice hysterically. You don't believe me, do you? You don't believe a thing I've been telling you. There was no other way for him to interpret Ryuji's expression. For Asakawa himself, watching the video had been like unsuspectingly opening a letter bomb. It was the first time in his life he'd experienced such terror. And it wasn't over. Six more days. Fear tightened softly around his neck like a silken noose. Death awaited him. And this joker actually wanted to watch the video. You don't have to make a scene, so I'm not scared. Do you have a problem with that? Listen, Asakawa, I've told you before. I'm the kind of guy who'd get front row seats for the end of the world if he could. I want to know how the world is put together, its beginning and its end, all its riddles, great and small. If someone offered to explain them all to me, I'd gladly trade my life for the knowledge. You even immortalized me in print, I'm sure you'll recall. Of course Asakawa remembered it. That's exactly why he'd opened up to Ryuji and told him everything. 
It had been Asakawa who first dreamed up the feature. Two years ago, when he was 30, he had begun to wonder what other young Japanese people his age were really thinking, what dreams they had in life. The idea was to pick out several 30-year-olds, people active in all walks of life, from an MITI bureaucrat and a Tokyo City Councilman to a guy working for a top trading firm to regular average Joes, and summarize each one. From their sort of general data, every reader would want to know their more unique aspects. By doing this regularly in a carefully limited area of newsprint, he would try to analyze what it meant to be 30 in contemporary Japan. And just by chance, among the 10 to 20 names that had surfaced as candidates for this kind of treatment, Asakawa had encountered an old high school classmate, Ryuji Takayama. His official position was listed as adjunct lecturer in philosophy at Fukuzawa University, one of the nation's top private schools. Asakawa found this puzzling, as he recalled Ryuji going to medical school. Asakawa himself had done the groundwork and had listed scholar as one of the vocations to be included in his survey. But Ryuji was far too much of an individual to be a fair representative of the 30-year-old budding scholars as a whole. His personality had been hard to get a handle on in high school, and with the added polishing of the intervening years, it seemed it had only become more slippery. Upon finishing medical school, he'd enrolled in a graduate philosophy program, completing his PhD the year of the survey. He undoubtedly would have been snapped up for the first available assistant professorship if it weren't for the unfortunate fact that there were older students in the pipeline ahead of him, and positions were awarded strictly on the basis of seniority. So he took the part-time lecturer's job and ended up teaching two classes a week on logic at his alma mater. <sighs> Before we continue, I don't remember exactly when it comes up, but it will at some point. Uh, hello, folks. Uh, Don, uh, Phil, Akatsuki, hello. I'm going to warn you. Um, this book does something that a lot of horror does, I feel like, where it creates a character that is incredibly unlikable so that you won't mind when they suffer so much. I mean, I haven't finished the whole book, but that's the vibe I get with this character. And I want to warn you because he is incredibly unlikable, and his backstory will involve some, um, uh, sex crimes. We're just gonna phrase it that way. Uh, n nothing too detailed, but I will give warnings when it comes up. I just wanted to brief everybody that there is some bad things in this man's past. He is not a good person, and hopefully he will be dragged into a, a ring into hell. Alright, where were we? These days, philosophy as a field of inquiry had drawn ever closer to science. No longer did it mean amusing oneself with silly questions such as how men should live. Specializing in philosophy meant, basically, doing math without the numbers. In ancient Greece, too, philosophers doubled as mathematicians. Ryuji was like that. The philosophy department signed his paychecks, but his brain was wired like a scientist's. On the other hand, in addition to his specialized professional knowledge, he also knew an extraordinary amount about paranormal psychology. Asakawa saw this as a contradiction. He considered paranormal psychology, the study of the supernatural and the occult, to be in direct opposition to science. Ryuji's answer. Au contraire, paranormal psychology is one of the keys to unlocking the structure of the universe. It had been a hot day in the middle of summer, but just like today, he'd been wearing a striped long sleeve dress shirt with the top button buttoned tightly. I want to be there when humanity is wiped out, Ryuji had said, sweat gleaming on his overheated face. All those idiots who prattle on about world peace and the survival of humanity make me puke. Asakawa's survey had included questions like this. Tell me about your dreams for the future. Calmly, Ryuji had replied, While viewing the extinction of the human race from the top of a hill, I would dig a hole in the earth and ejaculate into it over and over. Asakawa had pressed him. Are you sure it's okay for me to write that down? Ryuji had smiled faintly, just like he was doing now, and nodded. Like I said, I'm not afraid of anything. We're coming to it. Uh, content warnings for sexual assault. Like I said, I'm not afraid of anything. After saying this, Ryuji leaned over and brought his face close to Asakawa's. I did another one last night. Again. This made the third victim Asakawa knew about. He learned of the first one in their junior year in high school. Both of them had lived in Tama Ward in Kawasaki, 
an industrial city wedged between Tokyo and Yokohama, and commuted to a prefectural high school. Asakawa used to get to school an hour before classes started every morning and preview the day's lessons in the crisp dawn. Aside from the janitors, he was always the first one there. By contrast, Ryuji hardly ever made it to first period. He was what was known as habitually tardy. But one morning, right after the end of summer vacation, Asakawa went to school early as usual and found Ryuji there, sitting on top of his desk as if in a daze. Asakawa spoke to him. Hey, what's up? Didn't think I'd see you here this early. Yeah, well, was the curt reply. Ryuji was staring out the window at the schoolyard as if his mind were somewhere else. His eyes were bloodshot, his cheeks were red too, and there was alcohol on his breath. They weren't that close though, so that was as far as the conversation went. Asakawa opened his school book and began to study. Hey, listen, I want you to do me a favor, said Ryuji, slapping him on the shoulder. Ryuji was highly individualistic, got good grades, and was a track star as well. Everybody at school kept one eye on him. Asakawa, meanwhile, was thoroughly unremarkable. He, having someone like Ryuji ask him a favor didn't feel bad at all. I want you to call my house for me, said Ryuji, laying his arm on Asakawa's shoulders in an overly familiar manner. Sure, but why? All you have to do is call. Call and ask for me. Asakawa frowned. For you, but you're right here. Never mind that. Just do it, okay? So he did as he was told and dialed the number. And when Ryuji's mother answered, he said, Is Ryuji there? While looking at Ryuji, who stood right in front of him. I'm sorry, Ryuji's already left for school. His mother said calmly. Oh, I see. Asakawa said and hung up the phone. There, is that good enough? He said to Ryuji. Asakawa still didn't quite get the meaning of all this. Did it sound like there was anything wrong? Asked Ryuji. Did mom sound nervous or anything? No, not particularly. Asakawa had never heard Ryuji's mother's voice before, but he didn't think she sounded especially nervous. No excited voices in the background or anything? No, nothing special. Nothing like that. Just like breakfast sounds. Okay then. Thanks. What's going on? Why did you ask me to do that? Ryuji looked vaguely relieved. He put his arm around Asakawa's shoulders and pulled his face close. He put his mouth to Asakawa's ear and said, You seem like you can keep a secret. Like I can trust you. So I'll tell you. As a matter of fact, at five o'clock this morning, I raped a woman. Asakawa was shocked speechless. The story was at dawn that morning, around five, Ryuji had sneaked into the apartment of a college girl living alone and attacked. As he left, he threatened her that if she called the cops, he wouldn't take it lying down and came straight to school. As a result, he was worried the police might be at his house right now, so he'd asked Asakawa to call for him to check. After that, Asakawa and Ryuji began to talk fairly often. Naturally, Asakawa never told anything, anyone, about Ryuji's crime. The following year, Ryuji had come in third at the shot put in the area high school track and field meet, and the year after, he'd entered the medical program at Fukuzawa University. Asakawa spent that year studying to retake the entrance exam for the school of his choice, having failed the first time. The second time, he succeeded and was accepted into the literature department of a well-known university. Asakawa knew what he really wanted. In truth, he wanted Ryuji to watch the video. Ryuji's knowledge and experience wouldn't be of much use to Asakawa if they were based only on what Asakawa was able to verbalize about the video. On the other hand, he saw that it was ethically wrong to get someone else wrapped up in this to save his own skin. He was conflicted, but he knew if he had to weigh the two options, which way the scale would tip. He wanted to maximize his own chances of survival, no question. But still, he suddenly found himself wondering, like he always did, just why he was friends with this guy. His ten years of reporting for the newspaper had allowed him to meet countless people, but he and Ryuji could call each other up any time to go have a drink. Ryuji was the only one Asakawa had that kind of relationship with. Was it because they happened to have been classmates? No, he had plenty of other classmates. There was something in the depths of his heart that resonated with Ryuji's eccentricity. At that thought, Asakawa began to feel like he didn't really understand himself. Hey, hey, let's get a move on. You've only got six days, right? Ryuji grabbed Asakawa's upper arm and squeezed. His grip was strong. Hurry up and show me the video. Think how lonely I'll be if you bite the dust because we dawdled. Rhythmically squeezing Asakawa's arm with one hand, Ryuji grabbed his fork and jabbed his fork into his untouched cheesecake, shoveled it into his mouth, and began to chew noisily. 
Ryuji had the habit of chewing with his mouth open. Asakawa felt himself beginning to feel sick at the sight of the food mixing with the saliva and dissolving before his eyes. His angular features, his squat build, his bad habits. Now, while still munching away on cheesecake, he fished more ice out of the glass with his hand and started crunching it, making even more noise. That's when Asakawa realized he had no one else he could rely on but this guy. It's an evil spirit I'm dealing with, an unknown quantity. Nobody normal could deal with it. There's probably nobody but Ryuji who could watch that video and not bat an eye. Set a thief to catch a thief. There's no way around it. What do I care if Ryuji ends up dead? Someone who says he wants to watch the extinction of mankind doesn't deserve to live a long life. That was how Asakawa rationalized getting someone else wrapped up in this. What a nasty little turn to find out he has this friend that's, ooh, like that, you know? Um, I don't think that, the, that it's mentioned too much more in the future, but basically it establishes that this is a very horrible person. Um, a, a really self-centered person, a very violent person, and he's getting wrapped up in this situation. And uh, it kind of adds this edge to the story where, you know, we're not really rooting for these guys, are we? You know, one seems to be a kind of half-assed husband who put, you know, willingly befriends this guy that he knows is horrible and a criminal in a lot of bad ways. And the other guy, of course, is a criminal that doesn't care about people. And so are we rooting for them, really? I don't, I don't really think we are, but we want to understand the mystery. And so we are forced to ride along with these two people that we, you know, kind of like, oh, no, why are we in the car with these guys? I don't know. Um, I don't know that it's misogynistic exactly. I mean, obviously it's not going to be something that everyone enjoys because you don't always want to read that in your horror. Um, having read a lot of other old Japanese horror, I would say this is far more of a story about misogynistic people rather than a misogynistic story. Let's see, when did this come out originally? 1991 in Japan. Um, comparing it to like Hideyuchi, Hideyuki Kikuchi, whose works I love, but whose early works especially are just like all over the place with women. Whew. This is far more... I think it is done for a reason. It is done to really show us very early. Because I think we, you can kind of, this is weird to say, but you can kind of hand wave murder sometimes. Like, it's a little easier to be like, oh, he murdered a dude. He's a murderer. Fun! Whereas this kind of crime is not something that you empathize with in any way. It's just not, unless you're a total monster, which in which case, ooh. Yeah, we're kind of rooting for them to die. I feel like... The hero is still in the middle. I think he starts to see this situation shows him he's done some stupid fucked up things. He starts to really value his wife and child and not like this friend of his. But um, I haven't finished the entire book, so we'll see how it goes for him. If it goes anything like the movie, I feel like we're probably going to see Ryuji die and dude is probably going to try and turn around his situation. We'll find out. Hmm. And I can't speak on the whole series yet, as I've not read them all, so Raven of Roses may have a point. Uh, my feelings right now are pretty... I'm interested to see where it goes. But definitely very, very dark story. Hmm, chapter two. Oh, hello, Cygnus. Welcome. The two men headed for Asakawa's place in a taxi. If the streets weren't crowded, it took less than 20 minutes to get from Rapongi to Kita Shinagawa. All they could see in the mirror was the driver's forehead. He maintained a resolute silence, one hand on the wheel, and didn't try to start up a conversation with his passengers. Come to think of it, this whole thing had started with a talkative cabbie. If he hadn't caught a taxi that time, he wouldn't have been caught up in this whole horrific mess, Asakawa thought as he recalled the events of a fortnight ago. He regretted not having bought a subway ticket and making all those transfers anyway, no matter how much of a pain in the neck they were. "'Can we make a copy of the video at your place?' asked Ryuji. Asakawa had two video decks because of his work. One was a machine he'd bought when they'd first started to catch on, and it wasn't functioning as well as it could, but it did at least make copies with no problem. Yeah, sure. Okay, in that case, I want you to make me a copy as soon as possible. I want to take my time and study it at my place. He's got the guts, thought Asakawa, and in his present state of mind, Asakawa found his words encouraging. They decided to get out of the cab at Gotenzan Hills and walk from there. It was 8.50. There was still the possibility his wife and kid would be awake at this hour. 
Shizu always gave Yoko a bath at a little before nine and then put her to bed. <laughs> What's the music in the background? Um, which one did I pick today? This is from Broken Notes. This one's called Color Eterio. Broken Notes is a group that does uh, Silent Hill inspired music, which is probably why it sounds like Silent Hill to you. <laughs> Once she went to sleep, the, nothing was going to get Shizu out of bed. In an effort to maximize time talking alone with her husband, Shizu used to leave messages on the table saying, Wake me up! So when he got home from work, Asakawa would follow her instructions, thinking she really meant to get up and try and shake his wife awake. But she wouldn't wake up. He would try harder, but she would wave her hands around her head like she was shooing a fly, frowning and making annoyed sounds. She was half awake, but the will to go back to sleep was much stronger than Asakawa was, and he eventually had to cut his losses and retreat. Eventually, note or no, Asakawa stopped trying to wake her up, and then she stopped leaving notes. By now, nine o'clock had become Shizu and Yoko's inviolate sleepy time. On a night like this, though, it was more convenient that way. Shizu hated Ryuji. I wonder why. Asakawa thought this was an eminently reasonable attitude, so he never even asked her why. I'm begging you, don't bring him into our home anymore. Asakawa still remembered the repugnance on his wife's face when she said that, but most of all, he couldn't play this video in front of Shizu and Yoko. The house was dark and still, and the fragrance of hot bath water and soap wafted even into the entry hall. Evidently, mommy and baby had just now gone to bed, towels under their wet hair. Asakawa put his ear to the bedroom door to make sure they were asleep, and then showed Ryuji into the dining room. So the baby's gone night-night, Ryuji asked with an air of disappointment. Shh, said Asakawa, putting a finger to his lips. Shizu wasn't going to wake from something like that, but then again, he couldn't swear she wouldn't sense something was different and come out after all. Asakawa connected the output jacks of one of the video decks to the input jacks of the other, and then inserted the video. Before pressing play, he looked at Ryuji as if to say, Do you really want to do this? What's wrong? Hurry up and play it, urged Ryuji without taking his eyes off the screen. Asakawa pressed the remote into Ryuji's hand and then stood up and went to the window. He didn't feel like seeing it again. Really, he should watch it over and over, analyzing it cool-headedly, but he couldn't seem to find the will to chase this thing any further. He just wanted to run away. Nothing more. Asakawa went out onto the balcony and smoked a cigarette. He'd promised his wife when Yoko was born that he wouldn't smoke inside the apartment, and he'd never broken that promise. Although they'd been married for a full three years, he and his wife had a relatively good relationship. He couldn't go against his wife's wishes, not after she'd given him darling Yoko. See, I think it's starting to become more clear to him how much he values the two of them. He's thinking of them more rather than of his work. But it took the evil cursed videotape. Standing on the balcony, he peered into the room. Through the frosted glass, the image on the screen was flickering. The fear quotient was different watching it here, surrounded by three people on the sixth floor of a downtown apartment building, compared to watching it alone at Villa Log Cabin. But even if Ryuji watched it under the same conditions, he probably wouldn't lose his head and start crying or anything. Asakawa was counting on him to laugh and fling abuse as he watched, even turning a menacing gaze toward what he saw on the screen. Asakawa finished his cigarette and went to go back inside. Just at that moment, the door separating the dining room from the hall opened and Shizu appeared in her pajamas. Flustered, Asakawa grabbed the remote and paused the video. I thought you were asleep. There was a note of reproach in Asakawa's voice. I heard noises. As she said this, Shizu looked back and forth between the TV screen with its distorted images and staticky sound and Ryuji and Asakawa. Her face clouded over with suspicion. Go back to bed said Asakawa in a tone of voice that allowed for no questions. I think we ought to let the missus join us if she'd like to. It's quite interesting. Ryuji, still seated cross-legged on the floor, looked up. Asakawa wanted to yell at him, but instead of speaking, he balled all his thoughts up into his fists and slammed it down on the table. Startled by the sound, Shizu quickly put her hand on the doorknob, then narrowed her eyes and bowed ever so slightly and said to Ryuji, Please make yourself at home. With that, she turned on her heel and disappeared back behind the door. Two guys alone at night, turning videos on and off. Asakawa knew just what his wife was imagining. 
He didn't miss the look of disdain in her narrowed eyes, disdain not so much for Ryuji as for male instincts in general. Asakawa felt bad that he couldn't explain. Bye, Daniel. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you later. Just as Asakawa had expected, Ryuji was still utterly calm after he'd finished watching. He hummed as he rewound the tape, then set about checking it point by point. Alternately, alternate, alternately, I keep trying to read that word wrong. Alternately, fast forwarding and pausing it. Well, it looks like yours truly is mixed up in it now. You've got six days left, I've got seven, said Ryuji happily, as if he'd been allowed to join in a game. So, what do you think, said Asakawa? It's child's play. Huh? Didn't you used to do this sort of thing when you were a kid? Scare your friends by showing them a spooky picture or something and saying whoever looked at it would come to harm? Chain letters, that sort of thing? Of course Asakawa had experienced that kind of thing, too. The same sort of thing had come up in the ghost stories they'd told each other on summer nights. So what are you getting at? Nothing, I guess. Just that's how it felt to me. Was there anything else you noticed? Tell me. Hmm. Well, the images themselves aren't especially frightening. It seems like a combination of realistic images and abstract ones. If it wasn't for the fact that four people had died exactly as dictated in the video, we could just snort and pass it off as an oddity, right? Asakawa nodded, knowing that the words on the video were no lie was what made the whole thing so troublesome. The first question is, why did those poor fools die? What's the reason? I can think of two possibilities. The last scene in the video is the the statement, he who watches is fated to die. And then immediately thereafter, there was, well, for a lack of better word, let's call it a charm, a way to escape that fate. So the four erased the part that explained the charm, and because of that, they were killed. Or perhaps they simply failed to make use of the charm, and that's why they were killed. I suppose even before that, though, we have to determine if it was really those four who erased the charm. It's possible the charm had already been erased when they watched the video. How are we going to determine that? We can't just ask them, you know. Asakawa got a beer from the refrigerator, poured a glass full, and set it in front of Ryuji. Just you watch. Ryuji replayed the end of the video, watching closely for the exact moment when the charm erasing mosquito coil commercial ended. He paused the tape and began to advance it slowly, frame by frame. He'd go past it, rewind it, pause it, advance it again, frame by frame. Then finally, for just a split second, the screen showed a scene of three people sitting around a table. For just the briefest moment, the program, which had been interrupted by the commercial, was resuming. It was a late-night talk show broadcast, nightly at 11, on one of the national networks. The gray-haired gent was a best-selling author, and he was joined by a lovely young woman and a young man whom they recognized as a traditional storyteller from the Osaka region. Asakawa brought his face close to the screen. I'm sure you recognize this show, said Ryuji. It's the night show on NBS. That's right. The writer is the host, the girl is his foil, and the storyteller is today's guest. Therefore, if we know what day the storyteller was a guest on the show, we know whether or not the four kids erased the charm. I get it. The night show was on every weeknight at 11. If this particular episode turned out to have been broadcast on August 29th, then it had to have been those four who erased it that night at Villa Log Cabin. NBS is affiliated with your publisher, isn't it? This ought to be an easy one. Gotcha. I'll look into it. Yes, please do. Our lives may depend on it. Let's make sure of everything, no matter what. Right, my brother-in-arms? Ryuji slapped Asakawa on the shoulder. They were both facing their deaths now. Brothers-in-arms. Aren't you scared? Scared? Oh, contraire, my friend. It's kind of exciting to have a deadline, isn't it? The penalty is death. Fantastic. It's no fun playing if you're not willing to bet your life on the outcome. For a while now, Ryuji had been acting pleased about the whole thing, but Asakawa had worried it was just bravado, a cover for the fear. Now that he peered into his friend's eyes, though, he couldn't find the smallest fragment of fear there. Next, we figure out who made the video, when and to what end. You say Villa Log Cabin is only six months old, so we contact everybody who stayed in B4 and ferret out whoever brought in a videotape. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to limit the search to late August. Chances are it was somebody who stayed there right before our four victims. That's mine, too. Ryuji downed his beer in one swig and thought for a moment. Of course, we've got a deadline. Don't you have a buddy you can rely on? If so, get him to help. Well, there is one reporter who's got an interest in the case, but this is a matter of life and death. I can't just... Asakawa was thinking about Yoshino. 
Not to worry, not to worry. Get him involved. Show him the video. That'll light a fire under his ass. He'll be happy to help out, trust me. Not everybody's like you, you know. So tell him it's black market porn. Force him to watch it. Whatever. It was no use reasoning with Ryuji. He couldn't show it to anybody without figuring out the charm first. Asakawa felt he was in a logic he was in a logical cul-de-sac. To crack the secrets of the video would require a well-organized search, but because of the nature of the video, it would be next to impossible to enlist anybody. People like Ryuji, willing to play dice with death at the drop of a hat, were few and far between. How would Yoshino react? He had a wife and kid himself. Asakawa doubted he'd be willing to risk his life just to satisfy curiosity, but he might be able to help even without watching the video. Maybe Asakawa should tell him everything, just in case. Yeah, I'll give it a try. Ryuji sat at the dining room table holding the remote. Right then. Now this falls into two broad categories, abstract scenes and real scenes. Saying this, he rewound to the volcanic eruption and paused the tape on it. There, take that volcano. No matter how you look at it, that's real. We have to figure out what mountain that is. And then there's the eruption. Once we know the name of the mountain, we should be able to find out when it erupted, meaning we'll be able to ascertain when this scene was shot. Ryuji unpaused the tape again. The old woman came on and started saying God knew what. Several of the words sounded like some sort of regional dialect. What dialect is that? There's a specialist in my dialects at my university. I'll ask him about it. That'll give us some idea of where this old woman is from. Ryuji fast-forwarded to the scene near the end with the man with the distinctive features. Sweat poured down his face. He was panting while rocking his body rhythmically. Ryuji paused just b before the part where his shoulder was gouged. It was the closest view of the man's face. It was quite a clear shot of his features, from the set of his eyes to the shape of his nose and ears. His hairline was receding, but he looked to be around 30. Do you recognize this man? Ryuji asked. Don't be stupid. Looks faintly sinister. <laughs> if you think so, he must be pretty evil indeed. I'll defer to your opinion. As well you should. There aren't many faces that make that kind of impact. I wonder if we can locate him. You're a reporter. You must be a pro at this sort of thing. Shh, don't be funny. You might be able to identify criminals or celebrities by their faces alone, but ordinary people can't be located that way. There are over a hundred million people in Japan. So start with criminals. Or maybe porn actors. Instead of answering, Asakawa took out a memo pad. When he had a lot of things to do, he tended to make lists. Ryuji stopped the video. He helped himself to another beer from the refrigerator and poured some into each of their glasses. Let's drink a toast. Asakawa couldn't think of a single good reason to pick up his glass. I have a premonition, said Ryuji, his dirt-colored cheeks flushing slightly. There's a certain universal evil clinging to this incident. I can smell it. Ooh, yeah, we're gonna be talking about sexual assault again. I can smell it. The impulse I felt when I told you about it, right? The first woman I raped. I haven't forgotten. It's already been 15 years since then. I felt a strange premonition tickling my heart. I was 17. It was September of my junior year in high school. I studied math until three in the morning, then did an hour of German to give my brain some rest. I always did that. I found language study was perfect for loosening up tired brain cells. At four, as always, I had a couple beers and went out for my daily walk. When I set out, there was already something unusual budding in my brain. Have you ever walked around a residential neighborhood late at night? It feels really good. The dogs are all asleep, just like your baby is now. I found myself in front of a certain apartment building. It was an elegant wood frame two-story affair, and I knew that inside it lived a certain well-groomed college girl I sometimes saw on the street. I didn't know which apartment was hers. I let my gaze roam over the windows of all eight apartments in turn. At this point, I just looked. I didn't have anything definite in mind, just, you know. When my eyes came to rest on the southern end of the second floor, I heard something crack open in the depths of my heart, and I felt like the darkness had set forth its shoots in my mind and was gradually growing larger. Once more, I looked at all the windows in turn. Once again, in the same place, the darkness began to whirlpool and I knew, I knew the door wouldn't be locked. I don't know if she forgot or what. Gu guided by the darkness that was living in my heart, I climbed the apartment stairs and stood in front of that door. The nameplate was in Roman letters in Western order, given name first, Yukari Makita. I grasped the doorknob firmly with my right hand. 
I held on to it for a while, and then forcefully turned it to the left. It wouldn't turn. What the hell, I thought. And then suddenly there was a click, and the door opened. Are you with me? She hadn't forgotten to lock it at all. It unlocked itself at that very moment. Some energy was being exerted on it. Here, Ryuji interrupted the story. He seemed to be replaying the events agilely in the back of his mind, staring down distant memories with a mixture of tenderness and cruelty. Asakawa had never seen Ryuji look so conflicted. Two days later, on my way home from school, I passed in front of that apartment building. A two-ton truck was parked in front of it, and guys were hauling furniture and stuff out of the building. The person moving was Yukari. Sorry about that, Phil. It's definitely a very dark scene. Have a good one. I'm sure her dad didn't know the real reason his daughter was moving so suddenly, and so she disappeared from my life. I don't know if she moved back in, or got another apartment somewhere and kept going to the same college, but she just couldn't live in that apartment a second longer. <laughs> Poor thing. She must have been awfully scared. Can't wait until this guy is murdered. Can't wait until he's pulled down a well. <laughs> I think... I think that might be the last time he really talks about it. Again, I haven't finished the book, so I don't know, but I will continue to warn when that comes up. Asakawa found it hard to breathe as he listened. He felt disgusted, even to be sitting here drinking beer with this man. Don't you feel the least bit guilty? I'm used to it. Try slamming your fist into a brick wall every day. Eventually, you won't even feel the pain anymore. Is that why you go on doing it? Asakawa made a silent vow never to bring this man into his home again, at any rate to keep him away from his wife and daughter. Don't worry, I'd never do anything like that to your babykins. Asakawa had been seen through. Flustered, he changed the subject. You said you had a premonition. What was it? You know, just a bad feeling. Only some fantastically evil energy could come up with such an involved bit of mischief. Ryuji got to his feet. Even standing, he wasn't much taller than Asakawa when sitting down. He was, wasn't was even five foot three, but he had broad, sculpted shoulders. It wasn't hard to believe he'd meddled in shot put in high school. Well, I'm off. Do your homework. In the morning, you'll be down to five days left. Ryuji extended the fingers of one hand. I know. Somewhere, there's this vortex of evil energy. I know. It makes me feel nostalgic. As if for emphasis, Ryuji clutched the copy of the tape to his breast as he headed for the entry hall. Let's have the next strategy session at your place, Asakawa spoke quietly but distinctly. All right, all right. Ryuji's eyes were smiling. Ugh, this person's very good at writing an incredibly slimy character. Ugh, and you can feel the disgust just ugh, coming off the page. The morning Ryuji left, Asakawa looked at the wall clock in the dining room. A wedding gift from a friend, its butterfly-shaped red pendulum was swinging. 11.21. How many times had he checked the clock today? He was becoming obsessed with the passage of time. Just like Ryuji said, in the morning, he'd only have five days left. He wasn't at all sure if he'd be able to unlock the riddle of the erased part of the tape in time. He felt like a cancer patient facing an operation with a success rate of almost nil. There was debate over whether cancer patients should be told they had cancer or not. Until now, Asakawa had always thought they deserved to be allowed to know. But if this was how it would feel, then he preferred not knowing. There were some people who, when facing death, would burn brightly with what life they had left. Asakawa couldn't manage that feat. He was still all right for the moment. But as the clock chipped away at his remaining days, hours, minutes, he wasn't confident he'd be able to keep his wits about him. He felt like he understood now why he was attracted to Ryuji, even while being disgusted by him. Ryuji had a psychological strength he could not match. Asakawa lived his life tentatively, always worried about what people around him thought. Ryuji, meanwhile, kept a god or a devil chained up inside him that allowed him to live with complete freedom and abandon. The only time Asakawa felt his desire to live chased away his fear was when he thought of how his wife and daughter would feel after his death. Now he suddenly worried about them, and softly opened the bedroom door to check on them. Their faces in sleep were soft and unsuspecting. He had no time to shrink in terror. He decided to call Yoshino and explain the situation and ask for his help. If he put off until tomorrow what he could do today, he was bound to regret it. Yeah, it's a very well done book. It really 
it, it, it really takes you into the tension and the disgust and the feelings that the, the narrator is feeling and makes you feel them very vis viscerally. Um, I was really like, oh my god, this guy is awful and, and just, it, it's really lovely. And you can see how this is making him reevaluate his whole life, who he's friends with, how much he values his work, his family. He's changing from this experience. I'm curious to see where he ends up. Chapter 3, October 13th, Saturday. Asakawa had thought of taking the week off work, but decided using the company's information system to the full would give him a better chance of clearing up the mysteries of the videotape than holing up in his apartment, pointlessly cowering. As a result, he went into work even though it was a Saturday. Went into work, but he knew full well he wouldn't get any actual work done. He figured the best policy would be to confess everything to his editor, and then ask he be temporarily taken off his assignments. Nothing would help more than enlisting his editor's cooperation. The problem was whether or not Oguri would believe his story. He'd probably bring up the previous incident yet again and snort. Even though he had the video as proof, if Oguri started out by denying everything, he'd have all sorts of other arguments arrayed to support his view. He'd skewer all sorts of things his way to convince himself he was right. Still, it would be interesting, Asakawa thought. He brought the videotape in the briefcase just in case. How would Oguri react if he showed it to him? More to the point, though, would he even give it a glance? Last night, he'd stayed up late explaining the whole sequence of events to Yoshino, and he believed. And then, as if to prove it, he'd said he absolutely didn't want to see the video. Please don't show it to him. In exchange, he'd try to cooperate however he could. Of course, in Yoshino's case, there was a firm foundation for that belief. When Haruko Suji and Takahiko Nomi's corpses had been discovered in a car by a prefectural road in Ashina, Yoshino had rushed to the scene and felt the atmosphere there, the stifling atmosphere that the investigators convinced that only something monstrous could have done this, but kept them from saying so. If Yoshino hadn't actually been there himself, he probably wouldn't have accepted Asakawa's story quite so easily. In any case, what Asakawa had on his hands was a bomb. If he flashed it in front of Oguri's eyes threateningly, it ought to have some effect. Asakawa was tempted to use it out of curiosity, if for nothing else. Oguri's customary mocking smile had been wiped from his face. Both elbows were planted on his desk and his eyes moved restlessly as he went over Asakawa's story once again with a fine-tooth comb. Four young people almost certainly watched a particular video together at Villa Log Cabin on the night of August 29th, and exactly a week later, just as the video had predicted, they died under mysterious circumstances. Subsequently, the video had caught the eye of the cabin manager, who brought it into the office where it calmly waited until Asakawa discovered it. Asakawa had watched the damned thing, and now he was going to die in five days? Was he supposed to believe that? And yet those four deaths were an indisputable fact. How could he explain this? What was the logical thread to connect all this? Asakawa's expression as he stood looking down at Oguri had an air of superiority that was rare for him. He knew from experience just what Oguri was thinking right about now. Asakawa waited until he thought Oguri's thought process would have reached a dead end, and then he extracted the videotape from his briefcase. He did it with an exaggerated dignity, theatrically, as if laying down a royal flush. Would you like to take a look at it? You're quite welcome to. Asakawa indicated with his eyes the TV by the sofa under the window, flashing a composed, provocative smile. He could hear Oguri swallow loudly. Oguri didn't even glance in the direction of the window. His eyes were fixed on the jet-black videotape that had been placed on his desk. He was honestly trying to decide what to do. Oh, thank you for the support, Delvin. <laughs> if you want to watch it, you could just press play. It's that easy. Come on, you can do it. Just laugh like you always do and say how stupid it is and shove it in the video deck. Do it. Give it a shot. Oguri's mind was trying to issue the command to his body. Stop being such an idiot and watch it. If you watch it, doesn't it show you don't believe Asakawa? Which means, right, think about it now, it means if you refuse to watch it, you must believe the cock and bull story. So watch it already. You believe in modern science, don't you? You're not a kid afraid of ghosts. In fact, Oguri was 99% sure he didn't believe Asakawa. But still, way back in a corner of his mind, there was that what if. 
What if it were true? Maybe there were some niches in this world that modern science couldn't reach yet. And as long as there was that risk, no matter how hard his mind worked, his body was going to refuse. So Oguri sat in his chair and didn't move. He couldn't move. It didn't matter what his mind understood. His body wasn't listening to his mind. As long as there was the possibility of danger, his body would keep loyally activating his instincts for self-preservation. Oguri raised his head and said in a parched voice, So what is it you want from me? Asakawa knew he'd won. I'd like you to relieve me of my assignments. I want to make a thorough investigation of this video. Please. I think you realize my life is on the line here. Aguri shut his eyes tightly. Are you going to get an article out of it? Well, regardless of how I may appear to you, I'm still a reporter. I'll write down my findings so everything isn't buried with Ryuji Takayama and myself. Of course, whether or not you print them is something I'll leave to you. Oguri gave two decisive nods. Well, it can't hurt. I guess I'll have a cub take your feature interview. Asakawa bowed slightly. He went to return the video to his briefcase, but couldn't resist the temptation to have a little more fun. He proffered the tape to Oguri once again, saying, You believe me, don't you? Oguri gave a long sigh and shook his head. It wasn't that he believed or disbelieved. He just felt a tinge of uneasiness. Yeah, that was it. I feel the same way, were Asakawa's parting words. Oguri watched him walk out and told himself that if Asakawa was still alive after October 18th, he'd watch that video with his own eyes. But even then, maybe his body wouldn't let him. The what if didn't feel like it was ever going to go away. Hello? You still chilling back here? <laughs> In the reference room, Asakawa stacked three thick volumes on a table. Volcanoes of Japan, Volcanic Archipelago, and Active Volcanoes of the World. Figuring the volcano in the video was probably in Japan, he started with Volcanoes of Japan. He looked at the color photos at the beginning of the book. Mountains belching white smoke and steam rose gallantly into the sky, sides covered with brownish-black lava rock. Bright red molten rock spewing into the night sky from the craters whose black edges melted into the darkness. He thought of the Big Bang. He turned the pages, comparing these scenes to the ones seared into his brain. Mount Aso, Mount Asama, Showa Shinzan, Sakurajima. It didn't take as long to locate as he'd feared. After all, Mount Mihara on Izu Oshima Island, part of the same chain of volcanoes that included Mount Fuji, is one of Japan's more famous active volcanoes. Mount Mihara, muttered Asakawa. The two-page spread for Mount Mihara had two aerial shots and one photo taken from a nearby hilltop. Asakawa recalled the image on the video and tried to imagine it from various angles, comparing it to the photos. There was a definite similarity. From a perspective at the foot of the mountain, the peak seemed gently sloped, but from the air, one could see a circular rim surrounding a caldera in the center of which was a mound, which was the mouth of the volcano. The photo taken from a nearby hilltop especially resembled the scene in the video. The colors and contour of the mountainside were almost the same, but he needed to confirm it instead of just relying on his memory. Asakawa made a copy of the photos of Mount Mihara, along with two or three other candidates. Asakawa spent the afternoon on the phone. He called people who had used Cabin B4 in the last six months, he would have been better off meeting them face to face and gauging their reaction, but he simply didn't have that kind of time. It was tough to spot a lie just from a voice on a telephone. Asakawa pricked up his ears, determined to catch the slightest crack. There were 16 parties he needed to check out. The low number was due to the fact that the cabins hadn't been equipped with individual video decks when Villa Log Cabin opened in April. A major regional hotel was torn down over the summer, and it was decided to transfer the large number of VCRs it no longer needed to Villa Log Cabin. That was in mid-July. The decks had been installed and the tape library assembled by the end of the month, just in time for the summer vacation season. As a result, the brochure didn't mention each room had its own video equipment. Most guests had been surprised to see the VCR when they arrived and thought of it as nothing more than a way to kill time on a rainy day. Almost nobody had expressly brought a tape for the purpose of recording something. Of course, that was if the, he believed the voices on the phone. So who had brought the tape in question? Who had made it? Asakawa was desperate not to overlook anything. 
He chipped away at people's responses time and again, but not once did anybody seem like they were hiding something. Of the 16 guests he called, three had come to play golf and hadn't even noticed the VCR. Seven had noticed it, but hadn't touched it. Five had come to play tennis, but had been rained out and with nothing else to do had watched videos. Classic films, mostly. Probably old favorites. The last group, a family of four named Kaneko from Yokohama, had brought a tape so they could record something on another channel while watching a historical miniseries. Asakawa put down the receiver and cast an eye over the data he'd collected concerning the 16 groups of guests. Only one looked per pertinent. Mr. and Mrs. Kaneko and their two grades school-aged kids. They'd stayed in B4 twice last summer. The first time had been the night of Friday, August 10th, and the second time they'd stayed two nights, Saturday and Sunday, August 25th and 26th. The, the second time was three days before the four victims had been there. Nobody had stayed there on the Monday or Tuesday following the Kaneko's stay. The four teenagers were the very next people to use the cabin. Not only that, the Kaneko's sixth grade son had brought a tape from home to record a show. The boy was a faithful fan of a certain comedy series broadcast every Sunday at 8, but his parents, of course, controlled the TV. And every Sunday at 8, they made a habit of watching the annual historical miniseries on NHK, the public television network. There was only one television in the room, but knowing it had a VCR, the boy had brought the tape, thinking to record his show and watch it later. But while it was recording, a friend came over to tell him the rain had let up. He and his younger sister ran off to play tennis. His parents finished their program and turned off the television, forgetting the VCR was still recording. The children ran around on the courts until almost ten, then came home all tuckered out and went straight to bed. They, too, had completely forgotten about the tape. The next day, when they were almost home, the kid suddenly remembered he'd left the tape in, v in the VCR and shouted to his father, who was driving to go back. This turned into quite an argument, but eventually the boy gave up. He was still whimpering when they got home. Asakawa took out the videotape and stood it on his desk. Where the label would have been stuck the words Fujitex VHS T120 Super AV, glinted in silver. Asakawa redialed the Kaneko's number. Hi, sorry to call you again like this. It's Asakawa from the Daily News. There was a pause, then the same voice he'd spoken to before. Yes, it was Mrs. Kaneko. You mentioned your son left behind a videotape. Do you happen to know what brand it was? Well, now let me see, she replied, trying not to laugh. He heard noises in the background. My son's just got home. I'll ask him. Asakawa waited. There was no way the kid would remember. He says he doesn't know, but we only use cheap brands, the kind you buy in packs of three. He wasn't surprised. Who really paid attention to what kind of tape they used every time they wanted to record something? Then Asakawa had an idea. Hold on, where's the case for this tape? Videotapes are always sold in cardboard cases. Nobody just throws them away. At least Asakawa himself had never thrown away a cape case, neither for an audio cassette or a videotape. Does your family store your videotapes in their cases? Yes, of course. I'm very sorry, but could you please check to see if you have an empty case lying around? Huh? She asked vacantly. Even if she understood his question, she couldn't guess what he was getting at, and it made her slow on the uptake. Please, someone's life may depend on it. Housewives were susceptible to the matter of life and death ploy. Whenever he needed to save time and get one moving, he found that phrase had the right impact. This time, he wasn't lying. Just a moment, please. Just as he's expected, the voice changed. There was quite a long pause after she set down the receiver. If the case had been left at Villa Log Cabin along with the tape, it must have been thrown away by the manager. But if not, there was a good chance the Kaneko still had it. The voice returned. An empty case, right? That's right. I found two. All right, now the manufacturer's name and the type of tape should be printed on the case. Let's see, one says Panavision T120, the other is a Fujitex VHS T120 Super AV. The exact same name as on the videotape he held in his hands. Since Fujitex sold countless numbers of these tapes, this was hardly definitive, to, tr bleh, definitive proof, but at least he'd taken a step forward. That much was certain. This demon tape had originally been brought there by a sixth grade boy. It was probably safe to conclude. Asakawa thanked the woman politely and hung up the phone. Starting at 8 o'clock on the night of Sunday, August 26th, the video deck in cabin B4 is left recording. The Kaneko family forgets the tape and goes home. Then come the four young people in question. It's raining that day too. 
Thinking to watch a movie, they go, go to use the video deck, only to find a tape already inside. Innocently, they watch it. They see incomprehensible, eerie things. Then the threat at the end. Cursing the evil weather, they think up a cruel bit of mischief, erasing the section that tells how to escape certain death. They leave the video there to frighten the next guests. Of course, they hadn't believed what they'd seen. If they had, they wouldn't have been able to carry out their prank. He wondered if they remembered the tape at the moments of their deaths. Maybe there hadn't been any time for that before the Angel of Death carried them off. Asakawa shivered. It wasn't just them. Unless he could find a way to avoid dying in five days, he'd end up just like them. Then he'd know exactly how they felt when they died. But if a boy had been recording a TV show, where had the images come from? All along, Asakawa had thought that someone had shot them with a video camera and brought the tape there. But the tape had been set to record from the television, meaning somehow these incredible scenes had infiltrated the airwaves. He would never have dreamt it. The airwaves had been hijacked. Asakawa recalled what had happened last year at election time, when after NHK had signed off for the night, an illicit broadcast had appeared on the same channel, slandering one of the candidates. The airwaves had been hijacked. That was the only thing that fit. He was faced with the possibility that on the evening of August 26th, these images had been riding the airwaves in the South Hakone region, and this tape had picked them up purely by chance. And if that was true, then there must be a record of it. Asakawa realized he needed to contact the local bureau and find out some facts. I find that so fascinating since I feel like the movie, at least I, from what I remember, I've seen the American one ages ago, saw the Japanese one earlier this year. I felt like there was this feeling that this was kind of an urban legend that had been going on for quite some time, but the way the book writes it, it just started. The tape was just created and these are the first four victims. Kind of interesting. Mm. Chapter 4 It was 10 when Asakawa got home. As soon as he entered the apartment, he softly opened the bedroom door and checked the sleeping faces of his wife and daughter. No matter how tired he was when he got home, he always did this. There was a note on the dining room table. Mr. Takayama called. Asakawa had been trying to call Ryuji all day long, but he hadn't been able to catch him at home. He was probably out and about on his own investigations. Maybe he has something, thought Asakawa as he dialed. He let it ring ten times. No answer. Ryuji lived alone in his East Nakano apartment. He wasn't home yet. Asakawa took a quick shower, opened a beer, and tried calling again. Still not home. He switched to whiskey on the rocks. He'd never be able to get a good night's sleep without alcohol. Tall and slender, Asakawa had never in his life had an illness worth the name. To think that this was how he was sentenced to die. Part of him still felt it was a dream that he'd reached 10 o'clock on October 18th without having understood the video or figured out the charm. But in the end, nothing would happen, and the days would stretch out before him as they always had. Oguri would wear a mocking expression and expound on the foolishness of believing in superstitions, while Ryuji would laugh and say, We just don't understand how the world works. His wife and daughter would greet their daddy with the same sleeping faces. Even a passenger on an airplane falling from the sky can't shake the hope he'll be the one to survive. He drained his third glass of whiskey and dialed Ryuji's number a third time. If he didn't answer this time, Asakawa was going to give up for the night. He heard seven rings, then a click as someone picked up the receiver. Where the hell have you been all this time? He shouted without even checking to see who he was talking to. Thinking he was addressing Ryuji, he allowed his anger full vent, which only served to emphasize the strangeness of their relationship. Even with his friends, Asakawa always maintained a certain distance and carefully controlled his attitude, but he had no qualms about calling Ryuji every name in the book, and yet he'd never once thought of Ryuji as a truly close friend. But surprisingly, the voice that answered wasn't Ryuji's. Uh, hello, excuse me. It was a woman, startled from having been yelled at out of nowhere. Oh, sorry, wrong number. Asakawa started to hang up. Are you calling for Professor Takayama? Uh, well, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. He's not back yet. Asakawa couldn't help but wonder who this young, attractive voice belonged to. He figured it was a safe bet she wasn't a relative, since she'd called him Professor. 
A lover? Couldn't be. What girl in her right mind would fall for Ryuji? I see. My name is Asakawa. When Professor Takayama returns, I'll have him call you. That's Mr. T Asakawa, right? Even after he'd replaced the receiver, the woman's soft voice continued to ring pleasantly in his ears. <laughs> oh, let's see here. I think it's really interesting that he keeps... Like, there's some discussion in the book where he talks about he's so conscious and anxious about how people perceive him, so he behaves in a very controlled way, but he doesn't do that with Ryuji because he doesn't give a shit what Ryuji thinks about him because in, deep down he knows Ryuji's an asshole. And I think part of the reason he stays friends with him is because the feeling of not having to give a shit about what this person thinks of him, the anxiety being gone because he doesn't care what this guy, this guy's an asshole, you know? I think that's interesting. Uh, I, I, that's the feeling I get between the way that he talks about Ryuji and other people and why he b stays friends with this dude that he really truly hates, which it's a horrible coping mechanism, but I think it makes for a fascinating character. Uh, let's see here. Re Rereading this twice is giving me new insights into it and I'm really enjoying the main character. Futons were usually only used in Japanese-style rooms with tatami mat floors. Their bedroom was carpeted and had originally a Western-style bed in it, but when Yoko was born, they took it out. They couldn't have a baby sleeping on a bed, but the room was too small for a crib and a bed, so they were forced to get rid of their double bed and switch to futons, rolling them up every morning and spreading them out again every night. They laid two futons side by side, and the three of them slept together. Now, Asakawa crawled into the open space on the futons. When the three of them went to bed at the same time, they always slept in the same positions. But Shizu and Yoko were restless sleepers, so when they went to bed before Asakawa, it was less than an hour before they'd rolled around and sprawled all over. As a result, Asakawa ended up having to fit himself into whatever space was left. If he was gone, how long would it take for that space to be filled, Asakawa wondered. It wasn't that he was worried about Shizu remarrying, necessarily. It was just that some people were never able to fill the space left behind by the loss of a spouse. Three years? Three years would be about right. Shizu would move back home and let her parents take care of the baby while she went to work. Asakawa forced himself to imagine her face, shining with as much vitality as could be expected. He wanted her to be strong. He couldn't stand to imagine the kind of hell his wife and child would have to live through with him gone. Asakawa had met Shizu five years ago. He had just been transferred back to the main Tokyo office from the Chiba Bureau. She was working in a travel agency con connected with the Daily News conglomerate. She worked on the third floor, he worked on the seventh, and sometimes they saw each other on the elevator. But that was the extent of it, until one day when he'd gone to the travel agency to pick up some tickets. He was traveling for a story, and as the person handling the arrangements wasn't in, Shizu had taken care of him. She was just 25 and loved to travel, and her gaze told how much she envied Asakawa being able to go all over the country on assignments. In that gaze, he saw a reflection of the first girl he'd ever loved. Now that they knew each other's names, they started to make small talk when they ran into each other on the elevator, and their relationship rapidly deepened. Two years later, they married. After an easy courtship with no objections from either set of parents, about six months before their wedding, they brought, bought the three-room condo in Kita Shinagawa, their parents had helped with the down payment. It wasn't that they'd anticipated the spike in land value and had therefore rushed to buy even before the wedding. It was simply they wanted to get the mortgage paid off as quickly as possible. If they hadn't bought it when they did, they might never have been able to afford to live in the city like this. Within a year, their condo had tripled in value, and their monthly mortgage payments were less than half of what they would be if they'd been renting. They were constantly complaining the place was too small, but in truth it constituted quite an asset for the young couple. Now Asakawa was glad he had something to leave them. If Shizu used his life insurance to pay off the mortgage, then the condo would belong to her and Yoko, free and clear. I think my policy pays 20 million yen, but I'd better check to be sure. His mind was clouded, but he mentally divided up the money in different ways, telling himself he must write down any financial advice that might occur to him. He wondered how they'd rule his death. Death by illness? Accident? Homicide? In any case, I'd better reread my insurance policy. Every night for the past three days, he'd gone to bed in a pessimistic mood. He pondered how to influence a world he would have disappeared from, and thought about leaving a sort of last testament.
The next morning, Sunday, Asakawa dialed Ryuji's number as soon as he woke up. Yeah, answered Ryuji, sounding for all the world like he'd just woken up. Asakawa immediately remembered his frustration of the night before and barked into the receiver. Where were you last night? Huh? Oh, Asakawa. You were supposed to call, weren't you? Oh yeah, I was drunk. College girls these days sure can drink. <laughs> sure can do other stuff too, if you know what I mean. Woo-wee! I'm exhausted. Asakawa was momentarily at a loss. It was like the past three days were just a dream. He felt foolish for having taken everything so seriously. <sighs> well, I'm on my way over. Wait for me, said Asakawa, hanging up the phone. To get to Ryuji's place, Asakawa rode the train to East Nakano and then walked for ten minutes in the direction of Kami Ochiai. As he walked, Asakawa reflected, hopefully, that even though Ryuji had been out drinking the night before, he was still Ryuji. Surely he'd found something. Maybe he'd solved the riddle and he'd gone out drinking and carousing to celebrate. The closer he drew to Ryuji's apartment, the more upbeat he became, and he began to walk faster. Asakawa's emotions were wearing him out, bouncing back and forth between fear and hope, pessimism and optimism. Ryuji opened the door in his pajamas. Unkempt and unshaven, he'd obviously just gotten out of bed. Asakawa couldn't take his shoes off fast enough. He was still in the entryway when he asked, Have you learned anything? No, not really, but come on in, said Ryuji, scratching his head vigorously. His eyes were unfocused, and Asakawa knew at a glance that his brain cells weren't awake yet. Come on, wake up, drink some coffee or something. Feeling like his hopes had been betrayed, Asakawa put the kettle on the stove with a loud clatter. Suddenly, he was obsessed with the time. The two men sat cross-legged on the floor in the front room. Books were stacked all along one wall. So tell me what you've turned up, said Ryuji, jiggling his knee. There was no time to waste. Asakawa collected everything he'd learned the day before and laid it out chronologically. First, he informed Ryuji that the video had been recorded from the television in the cabin, beginning at 8 p.m. on August 26th. Really? Ryuji looked surprised. He, too, had assumed it had been made on a video camera and brought in later. Now that's interesting. But if the airwaves were hijacked, as you say, there should be others who saw the same thing. Well, I called our bureaus in Atami and Mishima and asked about that, but they say they haven't received any reports of suspicious transmissions flying around South Hakone on the night of August 26th. I see, I see. Ryuji folded his arms and thought for a while. Two possibilities come to mind. First, everybody who saw the transmission is dead. But hold on, when it was cast, the broadcast, the charm should have been intact. So, hmm. Anyway, the local papers haven't picked up on anything, right? Right, I've already checked that out. You mean whether or not there were any other victims, right? There weren't, none at all. If it was broadcast, other people should have seen it, but there haven't been any other victims, not even any rumors. But remember when AIDS first started to appear in the civilized world? At first, doctors in America had no idea what was going on. All they knew was they were seeing people die from symptoms they'd never encountered before. All they had was a suspicion of some strange disease. They only started calling it AIDS two years after it had appeared. That kind of thing happens. The mountainous valleys west of the Tana Ridge only contained a few scattered farmhouses on the lower reaches of the Atami Kanami Highway. That is a fun word. <laughs> hey, Jeff, welcome. If you gazed south, all you could see was the South Hakone Pacific land, isolated in the dreamy alpine meadows. Was something invisible at work in that land? Maybe lots of people were dying suddenly, but it just hadn't made it to the news yet. It wasn't just AIDS. Kawasaki disease, first discovered in Japan, had been going around for 10 years before it was officially recognized as a new disease. It was still only a month and a half since the phantom broadcast had been accidentally caught on videotape. It was quite possible the syndrome hadn't yet been recognized. If Asakawa hadn't discovered the common factor in four deaths, if his niece hadn't been among them, this illness would probably still be sleeping underground. That was even scarier. It usually took hundreds, thousands of deaths before something was officially recognized as a disease. We don't have time to go door to door down there talking to residents, but Ryuji, you mentioned a second possibility. Right, second. The only people who saw it are, the, are us and the four young people. Do you think the grade school brat who recorded this knew the broadcast frequencies are different region to region? What they're showing on Channel 4 in Tokyo might be broadcast on a completely different channel in the country. 
A dumb kid wouldn't know that. Maybe he set it to record according to the channel he watches on Tokyo. What are you getting at? Think about it. Do people like us who live in Tokyo ever turn to Channel 2? It's not used here. Aha. So the boy had set the VCR to a channel a local would never have used. Since they were recording while watching something else, he hadn't actually seen what was being recorded. In any event, with the population so sparse in those mountains, there couldn't have been too many viewers in the first place. Either way, the real question is, where did the broadcast originate from? It sounded so simple when Ryuji said it, but only an organized scientific investigation would be able to determine the transmission's point of origin. Wait, wait a minute. We're not even sure your basic premise is right. It's only a guess the boy accidentally recorded Phantom Airwaves. I know that, but if we wait for 100% proof before proceeding, we'll never get anywhere. This is our only lead. Airwaves. Asakawa's knowledge of science was paltry. He didn't even really know what airwaves were. He'd have to start his investigation there. There was nothing to do but check it out. The broadcast's point of origin. That meant he'd have to go back there. And after today, there were only four days left. The next question was, who had erased the charm? If they allowed that the tape had been recorded on site, it couldn't have been anybody but the four victims. Asakawa had checked with the TV network and found out the young storyteller, Shinraku Sanyute, had been a guest on the night show. They'd been right. The answer that came back was August 29th. It was almost certain the four young people had erased the charm. Asakawa took several photocopies from his briefcase. They were photographs of Mount Mihara on Izu Oshima Island. What do you think, he asked, showing them to Ryuji. Mount Mihara, eh? I'd say this is definitely the one. How can you be sure? Yesterday afternoon, I asked an ethnolo ethnologist at the university about Granny's dialect. He said it wasn't used much anymore, but it was probably one found on Izu Oshima. In fact, it contained features traceable to the Sashikiji region on the southern tip of the island. He's pretty cautious, so he wouldn't swear that was it. But combined with this photo, I think we're safe in assuming the dialect is Izu Oshima's, and the mountain is Mount Mihara. By the way, did you do any research into Mount Mihara's eruptions? Of course. Since the war, and I think we're probably okay in limiting ourselves to eruptions since the war, considering developments in film technology, this seemed a safe assumption. Right. Uh, now are you with me? Since the war, Mount Mihara has erupted four times. The first was in 1950-1951, the second was in 57, the third in 74, the fourth time I'm sure we both remember well, the autumn of 1986. The 57 eruption produced a new crater. One person died and 53 were injured. Considering when, excuse me, considering when video cameras came out, I'm guessing we're looking at the 86 eruption, but I don't think we can be sure yet. At this point, Ryuji seemed to remember something and started rummaging around in his bag. He pulled out a slip of paper. Oh yeah, evidently this is what she's saying. The gentleman kindly translated it into standard Japanese for me. Asakawa looked at the scrap of paper, on which was written, How has your health been since then? If you spend all your time playing in water, mon monsters are bound to get you. Understand? Be careful of strangers. Next year, you're going to give birth to a child. You listen to Granny now, because you're just a girl. There's no need to worry about local people. Asakawa read through it twice, carefully, and then looked up. What is this? What does it mean? How should I know? That's why you're gonna have to find out. We've only got four days left! Asakawa had too many things to do. He didn't know where to start. His nerves were on edge and he'd begun to lash out. Look, I've only got one more day to spare than you. You're the point man on this. Act like it. Give it your all. Suddenly, misgivings began to well up in Asakawa's heart. Ryuji could abuse his extra day. If, for example, he came up with two guesses as to the nature of the charm, he could tell Asakawa one, wait for Asakawa's survival or death to tell him which was right. That single day could turn into a powerful weapon. It really doesn't matter to you if I live or die, does it? Sitting there calmly like that, laughing? Asakawa wailed, knowing as he did he was becoming shamefully hysterical. You're talking like a woman now. If you've got time to bitch and whine, you ought to use your head a bit more. Ah, yes, my favorite, hopefully soon-to-be-dead character. Asakawa glared at him resentfully. I mean, how would you prefer I put it? You're my best friend. I don't want you to die. I'm doing my best. I want you to do your best, too. 
We both have to do our best for each other. Happy now? Midway through his speech, Ryuji's tone became childish, and he finished with an obscene laugh. As he laughed, the front door opened. Startled, Asakawa leaned over and peered through the kitchen at the entry hall. A young woman was bending over to remove a white pair of pumps. Her hair was cut short, brushing the top of her ears, and her earrings gleamed white. She took her shoes off and raised her gaze, her eyes meeting Asakawa's. Oh, pardon me, I thought the professor was alone, said the woman, covering her mouth with her hand. Her elegant body language and her pure white outfit clashed utterly with the apartment. Her legs below her skirt were slim and willowy, her face slender and intelligent. She looked like a certain female novelist who appeared in TV commercials. Come in, Ryuji's tone had changed. The vulgarity was concealed beneath a newfound dignity. Allow me to introduce you. This is Miss Mai Takano from the philosophy department at Fukuzawa University. She's one of the department's star pupils and always pays close attention in my classes. She's probably the only one who really understands my lectures. This is Kazuyuki Asakawa from the Daily News. He's my best friend. Mai Takano looked at Asakawa with some surprise. At this point, he still didn't know why she should be surprised. Pleased to meet you, said Mai, with a thrilling little smile and bow. The kind of smile that made any onlooker feel refreshed. Asakawa had never met such a beautiful woman. The fine texture of her skin, the way her eyes glowed, the perfect balance of her figure, not to mention the intelligence, class, and kindness she radiated from within. There was literally nothing to find fault with in this woman. Asakawa shrank back like a frog from a snake. Words failed him. Hey, say something, Ryuji elbowed him in the ribs. Uh, hello, he said finally, awkwardly, but his gaze was still transfixed. Professor, were you out last night? asked Mai gracefully, sliding her stockinged feet two or three steps closer. Actually, Takabayashi and Yagi invited me out with them, so... Now that they were standing next to each other, Asakawa could see Mai was a good ten centimeters taller than Ryuji. She probably only weighed half as much as he did, though. I wish you'd tell me if you're not coming home. I waited up for you. Asakawa suddenly returned to his senses. This was the voice he'd spoken to last night. This was the woman who'd answered the phone when he called. Meanwhile, Ryuji was hanging his head like a boy scolded by his mother. Well, never mind. I'll forgive you this time. Here, I brought you something. She held out a paper bag. I washed your underwear for you. I was going to straighten up here too, but you get angry when I move your books. From this exchange, Asakawa couldn't help but guess the nature of their relationship. It was obvious they were not only teacher and student, but lovers as well. How far can this man descend? On top of that, she'd waited here alone for him last night. Were they that close? He felt the kind of annoyance he sometimes felt when he saw a badly mismatched couple, but this went far beyond that. Everything to do with Ryuji was crazy. Then there was the love in Ryuji's eyes as he gazed at Mai. He was like a chameleon changing expressions, even his speech patterns. For an instant, Asakawa was mad enough to want to open Mai's eyes by exposing Ryuji's crimes. It's nearly lunchtime, Professor. Shall I fix something? Mr. Asakawa, you'll be staying too, won't you? Have you any requests? Asakawa looked at Ryuji, uncertain how to respond. Don't be shy. Mai's quite the chef. I'll leave it up to you, Asakawa finally managed to say. Mai immediately left for a nearby market to buy the ingredients for lunch. Even after she'd gone, Asakawa stared dreamily toward the door. Man, you look like a deer caught in the headlights of a car, said Ryuji with an amused leer. Oh, sorry. Look, we don't have time for you to space out like this. Ryuji uh, slapped Asakawa lightly on the cheek. We have things to talk about while she's gone. You haven't shown Mai the video. What do you think I am? Okay, then. Let's get through it. I'll go after we eat. Right. Now, the first thing you have to find is the antenna. The antenna? You know, the spot where the broadcast originated. He couldn't afford to relax then. On the way home, he'd have to stop by the library and read up on airwaves. Part of him wanted to rush down to South Hakone now, but he knew it would be quicker in the long run to do some background reading first, to get an idea of what he was looking for. The more he knew about the characteristics of airwaves and about how to track down pirate broadcasts, the more options he'd be able to give himself. There was a mountain of things to be done, but now Asakawa felt distracted, his thoughts somewhere else. He couldn't get her face, her body out of his mind. Why was Mai with a guy like Ryuji? He felt both puzzled and angry. Hey, are you listening to me? Ryuji's voice brought Asakawa down to the earth. There was a scene in the video with a baby boy, remember? Yeah. 
He chased Mai's image from his mind momentarily and recalled the vision of the newborn, covered in slippery amniotic fluid. But the transition didn't go well. He ended up imagining Maya naked. Oh, God. Oh, good job, buddy. When I saw that scene, I got a strange sensation in my own hands, almost as if I were holding that boy myself. Sensation. Holding someone. In the arms of his imagination, he was holding first my and then the baby boy in blinding succession. Then finally he had it. The feeling he'd had watching the video of holding the infant and then throwing both hands up in the air. Ryuji had felt the same exact sensation. This had to be significant. I felt it too. I definitely felt something wet and slippery. You too, huh? So what does it mean? Ryuji got down on all fours, bringing his face up close to the television screen as he replayed that scene. It lasted about two minutes, the baby boy giving his birth cry all the while. They could see a pair of graceful hands beneath the child's head and bottom. Wait a minute, what's this? Ryuji paused the video and began to sh advance it a frame at a time. Just for a second, the screen went dark. Watching it at normal speed, it was so brief as to be hardly noticeable. But watching it over and over, frame by frame, it was possible to pick out moments of total darkness. There it is again, cried Ryuji. For a time, he arched his back like a cat and stared at the screen intently, and he moved his head back and forth, his eyes darting around the room. He was thinking furiously. Asakawa could tell by the movements of his eyes, but he had no idea what Ryuji was thinking. In all, the screen went dark 33 times during the course of the two-minute scenes. So what? Are you telling me you've been able to figure out something just from this? It's just a glitch in the film. The video camera was defective. Ryuji ignored Asakawa's comment and began to search through other scenes. They heard footsteps on the outside stairs. Ryuji hurriedly pushed the stop button. Finally, the front door opened and Mai appeared, saying, I'm back. The room was once again wrapped in her fragrance. It was Sunday afternoon and families with children were playing on the lawn in the front of the city library. Some fathers were playing catch with their boys. Others were lying on the grass, letting their kids play. It was a beautiful, clear Sunday afternoon in mid-October, and the world, world seemed blanketed in peace. Faded with the scene, Asakawa suddenly wanted nothing more than to rush home. He'd spent some time on the fourth floor in the natural sciences section, boning up on airwaves, and now he was just staring out the window, looking at nothing in particular. All day, he'd found himself drifting off like this. All sorts of thoughts would come to him without rhyme or reason. He couldn't concentrate. Probably it was because he was impatient. He stood up. He wanted to see the faces of his wife and child now. He was overcome with the thought. Now! He didn't have much time left. Time to play with his daughter on the lawn like that. <laughs> the screaming you're hearing is my niece. She is downstairs yelling about something. <laughs> Let's see how much longer we got. Okay. Asakawa got home just before five. Shizu was making dinner. He could read her bad mood as he stood behind her and watched her slice vegetables. He knew the reason, too, all too well. He finally had a day off, but he'd left her early that morning, saying only, I'm going to Ryuji's place. If he didn't look after Yoko once in a while, at least when he had a day off, Shizu tended to feel swamped by the stresses of raising a child. And to top it off, he'd been with Ryuji. That was the problem. He could have lied to her, but then she wouldn't have been able to contact him in an emergency. There was a call from a realtor, said Shizu, not missing a beat with the knife. <laughs> yeah, Raven. Don't talk about it yet. Mm. There was a call from a realtor, said Shizu, not missing a beat with the knife. What about? He asked if we were thinking about selling. Asakawa had sat Yoko on his knee and was reading her a picture book. She most likely didn't understand, but they were hoping that if they exposed her to a lot of words now, maybe they'd accumulate in her head and come flowing out like a burst dam when she got to be two or so. Did he make a good offer? Ever since land prices has begun to skyrocket, realtors had been trying to get them to sell. 70 million yen? That was less than before. Still, it was enough to leave quite a bit for Shizu and Yoko, even after they paid off the mortgage. So what did you tell him? Wiping her hands on a towel, Shizu finally turned around. I told him my husband wasn't home. That's how it always went. My husband's not at home, she'd say, or I'd have to talk it over with my husband first. Shizu never decided anything on her own. He was afraid she'd have to start soon. What do you think? 
Maybe it's about time we considered it. We'd have enough to buy a house in the suburbs with a yard. The realtor said so too. It was the family's modest dream to sell the condo they were living in now and build a big house in the suburbs. Without capital, a dream was all it would ever be. But they did have this one powerful asset, a condo in the heart of the city, that had the means to make that dream come true. And every time they spoke of it now was with excitement. It was right there. All they had to do was reach out their hands. And then, you know, we could have another baby too. It was perfectly clear to Asakawa just what Shizu was seeing in her mind's eye. A spacious suburban residence with a separate study room for each of their two or three kids, and a living room large enough she didn't need to be embarrassed no matter how many guests dropped in. Yoko on his knee started to act up. She'd noticed her daddy's eyes had strayed from the picture book, that his attention was focused on something beside herself and she was registering her objections. Asakawa looked at the picture book once again. Long, long ago, marshy land was called Marshy Beach because the reed-thick marshes stretched all the way down to the seashore. As he read aloud, Asakawa felt tears well up in his eyes. He wanted to make his wife's dream come true. He really did, but he only had four days left. Would his wife be able to cope when he died of unknown causes? She didn't yet know how fragile her dream was, how soon it would come crashing down. I really love that the moment that this becomes something that's dangerous to him, you know, every time he thinks about it, yeah, there's the dread of losing his own life, but most of his thoughts are, what is my wife going to do? What is my child going to do? Like, he's so concerned about them, which is such a switch from the early part of the book where he barely even thinks about them. Like, it's clear that he's finally waking up to what matters. Now. You know. Better late than never. By 9 p.m., Shizu and Yoko were asleep as usual. Asakawa was preoccupied by the last thing Ryuji had brought up. Why did he keep replaying the scene with the baby and the old woman's words, next year you're gonna have a child? Was there a connection between the baby boy and the child the woman mentioned? And what about the moments of total blackness? Thirty odd times they occurred at varying intervals. Asakawa thought he'd watch the video again to try and confirm this. Ryuji had been looking for something specific, no matter how capricious it had seemed at the time. Ryuji had great powers of logic, of course, but he also had a finely tuned sense of intuition. Asakawa, on the other hand, specialized in the work of dragging out the truth through painstaking investigation. Asakawa opened the cabinet and picked up the videotape. He went to insert it into the video deck, but just at that moment he noticed something that stayed his hand. Wait a minute. Something's not right. He wasn't sure what it was, but his sixth sense was telling him something was out of the ordinary. More and more, he was sure it wasn't just his imagination. He really had felt something was funny when he touched the tape. Something had changed ever so slightly. What is it? What's different? His heart was pounding. This is bad. Nothing about this is getting any better. Think, man. Try to remember. The last time I watched this, I rewound it, and now the tape's in the middle, about a third of the way through. That's right where the images end, and it hasn't been rewound. Somebody watched it while I was away. Asakawa ran to the bedroom. Shizu and Yoko were asleep, all tangled up together. Asakawa rolled his wife over and shook her by her shoulder. Wake up, Shizu, wake up! He kept his voice low, trying not to waken Yoko. Shizu twisted her face into a scowl and tried to squirm away. I said wake up! His voice sounded different from usual. Wh what's wrong? We have to talk, come on! Asakawa dragged his wife out of bed and pulled her into the dining room. He held the tape out to her. Did you watch this? Taken aback by the ferocity of his tone, Shizu could only look back and forth from the tape to her husband's face. Finally, she said, Was I not supposed to? What are you so mad about, she thought. Here it is Sunday, and you're off somewhere, and I'm bored. And there was that tape you and Ryuji were whispering over, so I pulled it out. But it wasn't even interesting. Probably just something the boys in the office cooked up anyway. Shizu remained silent, only talking back in her mind. There's no call for you to get so upset over it. For the first time in his married life, Asakawa felt a desire to hit his wife. You idiot! But somehow he managed to resist the urge and just stood there, fist clenched. Calm down and think. It's your fault. You shouldn't have left it where she could see it. Shizu never even opened mail address to him. He figured it was safe leaving the tape in the cabinet. Why didn't I hide it? After all, she came in the room when Ryuji and I were watching it. Of course she'd be curious. I was wrong not to hide it. 
I'm sorry, Shizu mumbled discontentedly. When did you watch it? Asakawa's voice shook. This morning. Really? Shizu had no way of knowing how important it was to know exactly when she watched it. She just nodded curtly. What time? Why do you ask? Just tell me! Asakawa's hands started moving again. Around 10.30, maybe? It was right after Masked Rider ended. Masked Rider? That was a children's show. Yoko was the only one in the family who'd have any interest in that. Asakawa fought desperately to keep from collapsing. This is very important, so listen to me. While you were watching this video, where was Yoko? Shizu looked like she was about to burst into tears. On my lap. Yoko too? You're saying both of you watched the video? She was just watching the screen flicker. She didn't understand it. Shut up, that doesn't matter. This was no longer just a matter of destroying his wife's dreams of a house in the suburbs. The entire family was threatened now. They could all perish. They'd all die an utterly meaningless death. As she observed her husband's anger, fear, and despair, Shizu began to realize the seriousness of the situation. Hey, that was just a joke, right? She recalled the words at the end of the video. At the time, she'd dismissed them as a tasteless prank. They couldn't be real. But what about the way her husband was acting? It's not for real, right? Right? Asakawa couldn't respond. He merely shook his head. He was filled with tenderness for the ones who now shared his fate. Dun dun dun! <laughs> what a horrible place to stop, but that is where we're going to stop because my voice is a bit hoarse and uh, we're now about halfway through. Good place to end it. Uh, thanks for listening. Sorry that I've been a little off this weekend with scheduling and stuff, but um, having some family things around the house having to get done and changing up my sh my setup here a little bit. Not that you can see any of the changes yet. Next time, next reading tomorrow, I hope to have a new setup for readings. I'm going to try and have a little alcove uh, for those. It'll be fun, I hope. Um, anything else? Uh, member stuff is down temporarily. I'm moving everything to Dropbox because Google Drive sucks, and I should have done it ages ago, but I have more than a terabyte of stuff, so it was a big headache. <laughs> so uh, I'll be working on that for a while, so you may not be able to get to your stuff right now. Should be up next two, three days. Um, I think that's it for now. Aw, thank you for the support, Jeff. I love you. And hello, Min. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me, and thanks to all of our members like Alice and Jeff and Min and Delvin and Phil. Y'all keep the channel alive and allow me to do this silly stuff. Like Alice Draven and who else was here today? Uh, Y'all are amazing. Thank you so much. We'll be reading more stuff. Um, horror stuff will probably just be Sundays and then the rest of the week will be much more relaxed, less dark things. PS5R, PS, P5R soon. Um, thanks to you lovely people. Uh, I have a new computer. I have a new capture card. I have a Wii U. Y'all are amazing. And I'm gonna do a more a uh, specific thank you video at some point this week, but I'm just I'm overwhelmed I have a lot of stuff to set up and stuff So I will get to work on that and hopefully have more to share with y'all in the next couple days. Um Yeah, I'm gonna go jump on that and I will see you guys next time tomorrow with um a Heaven's official blessing and then a video game of some kind. <laughs> we'll figure that out tomorrow. Uh, see you later. Bye